everyone, and welcome to Crossing Pass Television. I'm Mark Wabazuski, co-hosting today with founder Don Reed Sr. And uh, we had a great show today. Why don't you introduce the, the guests for us? Well, you know, we've had so many varieties the last couple of days. A lot of them, this one came from Ken Falk from down around your area, right? Mm -hmm. And he recommended you, and Ken has been a blessing to us up here. You know, you remember his testimony? Oh, yeah. And uh, how he got saved and everything else. We got a lot of people coming up there and doing, giving their testimony. He said, get Jeff. And I said, okay, but you know what, Jeff? He said, he's powerful, so we're gonna have to see out. <laughs> and I believe it, I mean, you wouldn't be here, right? So anyways, it's Jeff Hensler, right? That's right. All right, Jeff, and you're from what, where at? Pittsburgh, In Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh area. Pittsburgh right. area? Mm -hmm. And what do you do for a living? So I own a, uh, a couple businesses. One is a carpet cleaning business I've had for 30 years, and a new one called Germ Carp that we just initiated because of the COVID-19 fiasco that everybody is uh, struggling under right now. So we do uh, electrostatic spraying for homes and businesses so that people can have a peace of mind and protection from the invisible enemy. Yeah, why don't we go a little bit into your background uh, for your testimony, like a little bit about your upbringing or your beliefs. And so I, like I grew up in Pittsburgh. My dad was a police commander for the city of Pittsburgh. We had a wonderful family. It was uh, six children growing up on the north side of Pittsburgh. And uh, we went through 12 years of parochial education, traditional Catholic family. My parents were uh, very good uh, to us and they were a great example to us. So I was just an average kid. I went to college, went to IUP locally, and uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do in life, but like many kids of that age, you just gotta figure out something. So I decided to go into business. And so I got a degree in business. And my first job out of there was uh, with uh, Scott Paper Company, and I was there for so several years locally in Pittsburgh, just being a sales rep in the uh, consumer grocery marketplace. But somewhere along the way, uh, God began to bring people into my life. In fact, the one fellow that I was working with, I was training, was a black fellow from the area. When I would go out with him in the field and visit him and train him, he would witness to me about Jesus. <laughs> now, I didn't know what witness was, but was really interesting. When he would talk about the things of God, he was really smart. I couldn't really figure that one out. Otherwise, he was just average. But when he talked about the things of God, I saw a marked difference in his intellect and his ability to persuade and his ability to talk about, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, that was for him. It wasn't for me. I was just tolerating it. But after about a year or so, God began to bring other people in my life. Another fellow, stranger, invited me to come to, a, I think it was called the Pittsburgh Prayer Experiment with Reed Carpenter back in the uh, 70s. And I found myself going up to a retreat up in Ligonier in 1980. It was a religious retreat. Now, it was very difficult for me to admit that I would go to a religious retreat because I was just an average Catholic boy. I mean, I went to church from time to time. I wasn't that bad. I didn't hurt anybody that I knew of, at least not physically. So here I find myself up in a retreat with some people that I didn't know, and we're in these little groups and are talking about faith, and it's uncomfortable because I just go to church and spend an hour and want to get out of there real quickly, and that's fine. But for whatever reason, I was there. And uh, I remember during one of the breaks, there was a, a fellow that spoke to me, and he talked about Jesus. And even though I was hearing what he said, I wasn't exactly hearing what he said. But I remember him telling me about it. Well, I left the retreat a little bit early, and on the way home, I remember in my car, and I don't know what I was doing. I think I was just having a dialogue. And I said, well, I didn't get whatever I was supposed to get there. Whether I was talking to God or whether I was talking to myself, I don't even know, but I remember kind of saying that or admitting that. Mm -hmm. So two days later, it's Tuesday night, it's 6.45. I'm on the phone with Ron, the fellow that... I was telling you about that uh, would witness to me from time to time. And we're just talking about work-related issues. And he said, well, what'd you do for the weekend? And I sheepishly said, well, 
I went to this retreat, and he said, really? And, and he said, well, tell me about it. And I explained a little bit about it. And I said, I didn't really get, I don't think, what I was supposed to. And then he said, you need to be saved. Ooh. What? Now, as a Catholic, I'm not familiar with that term. Mm -hmm. He said, you need to be born again. Wow. And I'm like, okay. And then he says, why don't you pray with me? Now, sometimes God gives us a measure of faith beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. <clears throat> so he just led me in the sinner's prayer, and I didn't know what that was, but it was a short prayer. And when we were done, him and his wife were all excited on the phone. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that was about it. You know, I figured, well, okay, I placated him for the moment. Little did I know that God had placed in my heart and spirit a new life. I had no clue what it was. Wow. Not long afterwards, he met me at a local Eaton Park, and he, of course, wanted to explain to me what happened. And I was kind of all over the board because, you know, okay, okay. But the, the matter was is that some of the things that he was saying was starting to pierce my mind and my heart mm -hmm. and make a little more difference. And then when we were done with the meeting, we stood up and he hugged me. Oh, that was really awkward. <laughs> I mean, really. It was just so. After that, he invited me to his church over in Hazelwood. And when I went there, uh, again, out of my territory, I'm only gone to Catholic churches. There I am in an all black church, small church. And I, I walk in the vestibule and there's uh, several people there. And they're acting like they knew me all my life. I'm like, what? They're, they're, they were so friendly, I couldn't understand it. But what was happening was the love of God that shed abroad on their hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. was visiting me in ways that I had never known before. And I was, I was so changed by that. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't interpret it. And then I went into the service, and for the first time, I heard the word of God preached, and it touched my heart in such a way that not only did it make me want more, but that very night I came back. And one of the local pastors, Pastor Joseph Garlington, was preaching that night as a guest preacher. And as they were uh, singing and praising God, I found myself dancing in the pew. <laughs> now, how in the world does that happen? Yeah. What did you know? So after that, I dil diligently sought after the word of God. I learned it. I, I memorized it. It became very important to me. And in 1981, I navigated through some other churches, and I, and I found myself in a little independent church in the YMCA, and I had the opportunity to speak publicly probably for the first time. And I remember that little sermonette, and I declared, victory is in defeat. Because God has given us power and authority to trample over the serpents and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so that was my message, victory, triumph. And since that time, I sought God in such a way that I wanted to be a part of his kingdom and make a difference. In 1986, I recall being involved with Channel 40, the executives of that time. We got together in, in a convocation and we planned what was called the uh, Pittsburgh Praise Celebration. And we got together with churches all throughout the Pittsburgh area, and we arranged a rally. And we marched from the Civic Arena at that time. We marched from the Civic Arena down to the point, and we marched for a purpose. There's a scripture that says in the Old Testament that one of the descriptive terms of God is the Lord is my banner. So we took down banners that represented the name of God, and we marched our, our way into that point at different points, and we declared the authority of God in the city of Pittsburgh to make the difference, to triumph over the enemy, and to usher in the opportunity for hope and for power and for the, for the move of God that has been declared and prophesied for many years. In 1988, I got a call from a friend of mine up in Cottersport. 
they wanted me to be involved in Pat Robertson's primary campaign, which I ran for about a year. And I got together volunteers and learned about that whole concept of what was going on in, in politics. Wow. The following year, I got a call from a fellow. And he said, you know, they're trying to pass a gay rights amendment down in the city of Pittsburgh, and nobody's opposing them. What do you think? Would you pray about it? Here I found myself on radio and television in, down there in front of city council saying, hey, this isn't a good thing. And so uh, from there, I started uh, a business and over the past 20 or 30 years have worked accordingly. Wow, amazing. You know, according to, I hear you're, in a sense, you know, so the Bible says some plant, some water, and God gives an increase, okay? The Catholic Church could have planted the Word of God in you, you know? And every time there was somebody crossing your path, <laughs> if I can say that, right? Mm -hmm. Different people, right? Absolutely. And then you end up on television, which you never thought, right? Mm -hmm. You're a businessman, and your number one is not business. Your number one is winning souls, am I right? That's right. Go ahead. Yeah, now we're going to take a little break here. We're going to go to uh, something to think about. Dawn has a message for us. Uh, related to the thorn in the flesh. So here's Dawn with the thorn in the flesh, something to think about. Hello, I'm gonna talk about a subject today that so many people are, I believe, confused on. You know, uh, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians, okay? Uh, chapter 12, verse uh, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and 11, uh, to just show you that we're gonna talk about a thorn in the flesh. And what is a thorn in the flesh? You know, let me describe what it says here. Paul had a thorn in, the, uh, in his side or in the flesh. A lot of people try to say it was this, say it was that. I'll give you my opinion. You can read it up yourself. See what you think, okay? But it says, And at least I should be exalted from measure above the abundance of the revelation that was given to me as thorn in the flesh. Now, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, least I should be exalted above measure. Now, this is Paul. He was well known. Naturally, everybody said, well, what could a thorn be? A thorn hurts, you know, when they had thorns in Jesus' uh, head there when he tried to crucify him and so forth. So, if a thorn can really hurt. But let me just show you, you could have a spiritual thorn or you can have something that God's trying to tell you something. And sometimes a thorn can be good, a thorn can be good, and it can be bad. And I want to tell you, show you how it can be good and bad, okay? And then he said, for this thing I sought the Lord. Who did he seek? The Lord. He didn't seek anybody else except the Lord. No friend, he just sought the Lord. I sought the Lord, that it might depart from me. Now, and he said unto him, my and this is what the Lord said to Paul now. He says, for this thing I sought, I depart the Lord. He said, he said, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect, and therefore I would rather glory in my infirmities, okay? This is what Paul, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He's saying that my strength is, is made stronger when this flesh, when this thorn, God said it's gonna, it keeps you humble. Now what is the word humble? Did you know people that somebody got this thing wrong? That it said, God, it was, God just was telling him to be humble yourself. Now people can get so high but remember, a friend told me one time, he said, well, I'm a drunk, Don, and I, the only thing I've had, and he's a Christian, he said, and the only thing I do is I get drunk once in a while. I said, no, let me tell you something. A thorn in your flesh will never cause you to go to hell. Drunkenness can go to you to hell, get you to go to hell. So that's, that's not the particular case. And then it goes on and say in, in, uh, uh, in number 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities, persecution and distresses, for his sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So a thorn in your flesh could be something in the past. What do you think about Paul? Many people thought, well, he has eyes or this and that. Could have been that when he was on the road to Damascus, you know, his conversion, could have been that he, after he got saved, that he would think about some of the things he'd done by dragging Christians out and killing them. Families over, or just on the road to Damascus, that's what he was going to do, put people in jail. That's Paul was what he was doing. So maybe you've done something in the past and it keeps popping up to you and God is permitting it. Now hear me, he's permitting it. it. It's not going to send you to hell. It's not going to be committing adultery. It's not going to be something like that, but maybe a thought or maybe a friend you did something to, or a wife, or a husband, or whatever you've done in my life. It keeps popping up, and it reminds you of your past. 
But remember one thing, the Bible says, God forgives your past, your present, and the future. This is the nice part about it. If you read that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7, 8, 9, and 10, put yourself in there. Maybe there's a thorn, you hear me? A thorn in the flesh that is keeping you humble. Maybe it's a thought to remind you of your past coming in. The devil will do that. Jesus will take your thoughts away, but he still gives you the right to think and be yourself. So remember this, sometime a thorn in the flesh could be a blessing. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Don, with that message. Now we're back here with Jeff and we're gonna talk about what's next for you. You talked about how you, you got saved and really for the first time, you're understanding what it means to be a servant of God. Uh, what was next for you? Well, when I became a born again Christian, it, it hit me really hard. And the, the only thing I really wanted to do was tell everybody. I, I mean, I, don't, I wasn't proclaiming myself to be an evangelist, but something significant had happened. And the first people I wanted to talk to were my family. And as I did, they kind of took a little different point of view. They thought I had gone off the deep end. And, uh, but the point is, is that God wants to use us so that we can use our voice to make a difference. Mm. And you know, the scripture tells us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Right. And our testimony is powerfully important because it's life changing. And when we are willing to use courage and faith to touch the lives of others, then God is able through the power of the Holy Spirit to make the difference. You see, I didn't know it, but I had nothing to do with my salvation. God gave me the gift of repentance. I couldn't even do that on my own. Repentance is a gift. And so is salvation. So in order for my eyes to be open, God had to remove the blinders through that gift of repentance. And what is repentance? It's not just being sorry. It's turning away 180 degrees from what you were to what God wants you to be. In a spiritual sense, in a scriptural sense, it's this. God takes us from the kingdom of darkness and puts us into the kingdom of his marvelous son. And we're adopted as children so that we're able to say, Abba, Father. And the good news is, even as babes in Christ as we all are when we're first born again, that he's there with us and he works with us through all the trials and tribulations that we go through. And as our faithfulness stands, he gives, gives us more opportunities. And regardless of what we face, it doesn't matter what the temptations are. God's word tells us that he will give us a doorway of escape. And if we ever have a need, all we got to do is ask him. We can call upon his name and actually have audience with him in the throne room of his presence. That's hard to even imagine. But see, the scripture tells us we're seated together with him in heavenly places even now. Yeah. So we have the authority, we have the power, we have the purpose to make the difference. And the thing that holds us back is fear. But God has a remedy for that. Whether it's Joshua or Moses or Paul or Gideon or Mary or Joseph. The angelic hosts visit us and they say two words, fear not for God is with us. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. In this world right now where we see the most imperilous times we've ever known, all you have to do is turn on the television and you watch hell on earth erupting in U.S. cities. Now look, there's not a lot I can do to change that. Oh, I can go out there with a sign and protest. And I'm not saying there's anything a matter with that. And in the natural sense, it's okay to register your, 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 your opinion 
and to demonstrate accordingly. But what we have to look at is what does God want us to do? And what God wants us to do is he wants us through the power of prayer and supplication and intercession with thanksgiving to, be go, out, to go out there and pull down spiritual strongholds with the power that he's given us so that we can see the change that God would have us see. There's no way in our humanity, there's no political power, there's no natural authority that's going to stem the tide that we're facing right now. But I want you to know something. God is so merciful and his grace is so powerful that he's given us a great opportunity that we can all participate in. It's called the return. Now, what is the return? The return is an opportunity for Christians worldwide and in this country and in every living room and everywhere on this earth to participate in a proclamation that's being made currently through a noted author named Jonathan Kahn. Mm. He has arranged a holy assembly, a convocation in the great city of D.C., where he is asking men and women to come based on the scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And as you know, that's one of the most heralded scriptures of our time. It's a time when King Solomon, when he was, when he was uh, going to uh, bring his temple, dedicate his temple, he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and depart from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will hear their land, heal their land. And so what is happening on September 26, in just a couple months, actually next month, there is going to be an assembly in D.C. for this purpose, where people are coming to pray, to repent, to ask God for his forgiveness, so that maybe by his mercy and by his grace that we can stem the evil that has permeated our society, that we can hold back the fear that covers the media and airways that has caused people to be debilitated right now because of the unknown and the fear of what's going to happen. I want you to know that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And this message that I'm talking about needs to be proclaimed now so that people can respond physically and go and assemble in, in Washington, D.C. on September, September 26th, that Saturday. Now, not just that, because many people won't be able to go there, but because it's being simulcast, whether it's on your phone, your computer, in your church, on your television screen, regardless, all you need is an internet connection, and you can be a part of this worldwide live event. And Jonathan Cain is going to be the speaker? He will be the speaker along with others. And, uh, in one minute, can you tell who Jonathan Cain is? A lot of people don't Jonathan Cain is a noted author. He's a prophetic spokesman that has written four books, right. The Harbinger and the most, the most recent one's called The Oracle. He's a rabbi. He's a pastor in New Jersey. He's had international notoriety, and he's a, a wonderful spokesman of God. Yeah. And he has put together a website called thereturn.org. And I would encourage all the viewers to go to thereturn.org so that you can see how you can be a part of. It doesn't cost anything. It's free for all, but everybody needs to be a part of it. Could someone decide, if they decide to take a busload of people down there? They could take a busload. Just go on that website, okay. and you will find the information and the resources available. I want to read something that happened over 100 years ago. President Abraham Lincoln, during the time of when this nation was divided, made a proclamation of this same uh, theme. And it reads, dated March 30th, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln stated, whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope 
that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. Wow. It's been... time for revival. Thank yes. you, Jeff. Thank you. I cannot believe, and we've got so much in the time that you've been here. I mean, boy, you get me all excited or jumping up and whatever, but that's the truth out there. And their salvation is free. The discipleship is costly, we call it. But if you haven't made that choice, make it today. Call the telephone number on the screen, 724-981-777. There's no long sinner's prayer. Just ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. He's like me. He was raised in a decent family, but he wasn't saved. I don't care what a Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, okay? Someone planted the seed, and he started, and here today he's telling people about Jesus. He's not even talking about his business. He took time. His business today is Jesus winning souls. His business to make money is second. And I yeah, thank you for taking the time to come out here today. So remember, people are standing by. Write us a letter. We appreciate it. Now tell somebody too. Tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Tell them if you got saved and call that telephone right now. God bless you. There are over 10 million problem pathological gamblers right now in America. My life was engulfed in that total lifestyle that I was living. Compulsive gamblers, pathological gamblers, are like full-blown alcoholics. They cannot help themselves. They cannot stop. They will lose everything. I start hating myself indirectly when I'd lay down in bed at night and I'd say, try to reason out, why am I doing this? You live in fear, known, not knowing what's going to walk through the door. Is it going to be Don Reed or is it going to be the monster? You're trying to find who you really are. People are looking for it. They're looking for that peace. I really wanted to stop, but I didn't know how to stop.